Well, guys, it's my fault. You've been asking, and uh, you know, there's nobody to blame but me. Black Jay <laughs> caged in the lead up to the national. Uh, you know, I've seen Sharon a couple of times. She's like, we got to record, and I'm like, yeah, we got to record. And I just, you know, <laughs> work. I, I mean, you know, the episodes. You know, the C Bless taking his shirt off, and I just want to dedicate a whole episode to that. And you know, but how could we not do an episode? Of Black Jade Wolf <laughs> Uncaged in the lead up to the national. We have to. This is a show about shows, and this is the <laughs> show. So welcome back. And my apologies. Thank you. Thank you. So, I, I waited for this one. So I'm gonna just throw it out there. One question. Why is the national different? Uh it's best of the best, you know. <laughs> That's it, right? I mean, yeah. so so you give us a whole bunch of great stuff. We talk about shows you've been to, we talk about shows you're gonna go to, we talk about the prep for it. I usually would start off with like, what what are some shows you were at recently? And we can get into that if you like. But just, you know, as a as a, a lead up to national, people probably be listening to this on their way to national or as they prep for national. I put a joke in there, you know, Monday, what is it, Monday the 24th. I put it on my story. Monday the 24th is a national holiday. It's national. Should be. Prep, <laughs> prep your cards and get ready for the national. And fit uh, them into mine was bag. too. But. <laughs> <laughs> so what do you do? Like, how long does it take for you to prep for the national? What's different about prepping for the national? Just let's get into it. Okay. Uh, national to me is a little different. Always, you know, we always plan on like, you know, the wholesale thing, but I actually keep some for retail because it's one of the best probably retail show in, in the country, you know? Um, so I, I hold some for uh, the repack people, but I make sure I have like 22 showcase, you know? So it's like, I have to have retail there, you know, it's, and it's not, I could wholesale them easily and, you know, probably get the same money, <laughs> but you know, it's, it's, it's for the, it's for the people that paid to be there. You know, they, they want to pick up a cheaper $50 for the kids slab, or they could pick up a million dollar card if they want to, you know, Ooh, you bring in some million <laughs> well, dollar cards. No, no, I'm not bringing any <laughs> of those. <laughs> Um, but, uh, it's, it's probably the most fun show. There's tons of, uh, events after it's just so packed this, this show. I mean, there's tons of like every company has their own party, you know, so impossible. To but, go to uh, all. I plan on retail selling, huh? Impossible to try to go to all of them. Can't go to all of them. Yeah. It's it's like Friday. There's like four parties, so <laughs> I don't even know that's possible. I RSVP to three of them. So <laughs> I, I got a fourth one also. The the one that's going to suffer is the yep. one that's not like within the locale, right? The one that's not like within walking distance. Everything else is kind of walkable. Yep. Everything else is very near. Then you have a couple of people who are doing you know events at the same time that are you know you either have to get in a cab or Uber or something like that, and it just you know you mm -hmm. can hit three events. An hour at each one, you know, walkable here, walk to this one. Yep. But uh, once you start getting into, you know, going out there into Chicago proper out of Rosemont, it makes it tougher. Yeah, exactly. And the best way to think about it is it's, they're good events, but you need to consider which one are you trying to really build relationships with, you know. Uh, if it's a company that you plan on doing business later, uh, prioritize that place first, you know. Uh, obviously one of my priorities, woman of the hobby, they have like a softball thing going. Uh, there's the like park. a trade night. There's also, yeah, it's in the ballpark and Kayla is actually throwing out the first pitch. So that'd be fun. Um, yeah. And then there's arena club, everything you could think of, you know, they have, uh, eBay has a collectible too. Beckett has one too. So there's there's tons of stuff, you know, and if you want to ask any questions to all those companies, you know, um, make some connection, it's it's good to attend them. It's, I mean, you know, it's like, it's meetings. It's like you're a shareholder of some of these companies. You have to go to like, you know, the, the Berkshire Hathaway meeting and talk to Warren Buffett. Who would be that Warren Buffett? Once famously, Shea Wave Vlogs came on my show and said that he was the Warren Buffett of the hobby. I'm not sure anyone <laughs> other than he would agree with that. Um, but I mean, listen, it's, it's fun. I'll tell you what I like. And then, you know, we can, we can, we can get into it. It's an, it's a fun mix of kind of hobby regulars. And then, you know, the hobby people who are only going to show up to be hobby people this time, because it is that Super Bowl of the hobby. That's, I guess what I, what I'll call mm -hmm. the national. Right. And it's, you know, you, 
for good or for bad, because there are going to be people who are like, I'd rather the hobby not have those people, right? But Gary V is going to be there set up. You know what I mean? And, you know, some people yep. like that. Some people don't, right? But he's going to draw people. You know, people will come in and, yep. and you know, shake hands and take mm -hmm. pictures. And um, and that's that that carnival type of atmosphere that you have there. Um, you know, I'm looking forward to seeing Lefko. I only get to see that guy at yep. Nationals. I know he, he's going to be there. You know, he's, he's, a, he's a real life celebrity. He, mess he messaged me yesterday asking me if I have any big hurts, you know. So. Yeah, see, you know, he's, he's, I, I told him to sell, but he's holding strong on his hurts kaboom. And, uh, he's the Eagles you know, fan, so. <laughs> yeah, I mean, he's an Eagles fan. So, I mean, the 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 other thing I would say, I like I like the myriad of companies in each kind of uh, vertical that are going to be competing with each other. And I like to see who steps their game up and what they do in their booth. You know, I mean, look, Josh Luber is no longer with us at uh, Fanatics. Uh, maybe he shows up. Maybe he's doing something else. I think he was at Comic-Con. I think I was looking at his stuff. But, I mean, he that was. Zero Cool mm -hmm. booth, that was pretty cool what they did with, like, the, the Stranger Things and, the you know, the yeah. whole setup that they had. Those um, are still selling very well. I actually so, feel them. So the, the Stranger Things, yeah, I have a Billy Butcher autograph. There are only eleven of those uh, different one maids, but uh, different posters design. I got a couple of boxes of those. They were pretty delayed. The Butcher Billy ones. I got I got mm -hmm. a couple of cards. I don't know what. I mean, I watched the show, but I don't know which ones. I didn't get like a one of one, but I got. I got I got a couple numbered cards. I, I gotta figure out what to do with those. Now you tell me there's a market for them. I'll have to look. <laughs> no, there is definitely the main characters you know the four top kids so uh i don't think i got anything of the main characters i think i got what's the papa i think i got the dad the, the, who's not really oh. a dad he's like the doctor <laughs> but they call him papa i think okay, that's no. what i got i think i got a blue bordered number to 11 of that oh one in a box oh, okay I that's probably good. not the i don't know it was in like the blasters the butcher billy but i don't know version i don't know yeah. what the heck it was that mm -hmm. i got um, that and oh, we opened a box of Jackass, and Ian got a Johnny Knoxville auto. Oh, nice! So that was pretty okay. cool. <laughs> you know, I don't know where that is, but we definitely opened one. It's somewhere. It's somewhere in this house of cards. <laughs> There's tons of a uh, bleaker event too at that time. So yeah, they were all for the cast. You know, yeah. Let's see. You know, I mean, last year I was last year was a selling buying. I bought like probably the most international. So I have a feeling this year is going to be a little, I think tons of people are buying. Okay. Uh, there's, so the last five shows I've been to, it, it's not easy to, to buy, you know? So let's see what are, what the people, the collectors mode this year, you know? So you we'll talk about the last five nationals. I'm or counting the last that's five more like a selling show. That you've been to leading up to the nationals. So the last started to be. Show, yeah. Uh, everybody like people are actually buying so it's harder for dealers to like walk up buys are less basically wow so less people giving you so, their stuff to wow that's interesting what do you think less, that means well, what you, people are learning their people are selling to repacks too so there's less for dealers to buy in the booth so dealers would actually have to change and probably walk around and to pick up some stuff so for a while i didn't do that because, you know, people, I kind of save up my money to buy on the table, like when people bring me stuff. So let's see. I might have to uh, pivot a little. It's funny to think about that, right? And we'll get into the national a little bit more in the shows. But I love talking to you because I never know which way the conversation is going to go, right? I've been doing a lot of thinking about where the hobby is going to go and what happens to middlemen. But I've always thought of that as, you know, the card stores and dealers as middlemen of product, right? Like, okay, Fanatics is going to come in and it's going to be tough for those stores that were very heavily dealer net dependent. The ones who were, you know, getting the products, selling some in-house, selling some in store, but they were getting so much that they were <laughs> actually able to give it to blowout. They were able to give it to other dealers and those people with a markup at each one. And Fanatic comes in and says, well, why would we let this happen? You know, it's just getting marked up, marked up, marked up so many times before yep. it gets into the actual consumer's hands. I never thought about it with repacks. So you were a middleman 
a middle woman. I mean, that's just the phrase. Yeah. You, were, you were the middle person on those deals. You know, the, the retail, you know, the card owner would come up. They graded some cards. They don't like it. It's a nine, but it's still a Tyrese Maxi. So it sells. It's still a, you know, a, a Jalen Hurts. It sells. You would grab it from them in a bulk deal. And then you would basically wholesale it out to a break, uh, a, a repacker. And the repacker selling it to a consumer after the fact. Are you saying are, are yeah. the are the repackers now getting you know smarter and reaching out to the to the people who are walking at the shows? Are they are they getting their cards elsewhere or just the, um, the consumers are understanding that well, that's a place to sell? Well, repacks now are setting up and getting their own tables. So mm. you know, uh, I mean Burbank. They have their own, so you could see lines now lined up in Burbank booth or David Adams booth, you know, to sell to them and even Pittsburgh, you know. So now they don't even, they still have people walking around, but there's still people that are like literally just going to their booth to sell. So that that's another thing to consider. So now why, if they put a banner out there that they're paying 85 percent why would they go to a dealer that you know might pay a little less so it, right. it's just you know it's a tougher competition so as a dealer you just gotta work a little harder and change your strategy i mean listen it's fun to watch the whole economy of this you know i i, I bring my son to stuff and you know it's sort of you know watch him negotiate watch him make trades and there's a lot of lessons to be learned and i mean the hobby is but people don't like to compare it to stocks. People don't like to compare it to other markets or other assets. And it's not, they, you know, they, they, they're not, every card is not exactly the same. It can't really be like a share of Disney and that kind of stuff. But, you know, imperfect markets, companies come in and figure out a way to make them more perfect. They figure out a way to come in and squeeze, you know, the right deal out of it. So for somebody like you, right, somebody like you, where that was an, a, a method of doing business, right, you were able to go to a show and you know, pick up these cards that you knew you'd be able to make a small amount of profit on selling them to a, a repacker. If that's not there, what do you do? How do you pivot? How does that change what you're doing? Um, well, I don't just buy and, and resell to repack because that's the thing. I, I run a different, like, um, I, I also grade. I also uh, have a investment part of my, you know, my portfolio. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there are stuff that I'm not going to sell at cheap price. I'm not just going to buy a card for a hundred and flip it for one twenty. It, it's, it, you're not going to make money because of the overhead and, you know, employee and all that stuff. You got to think of some got to be graded, some got to be, um, some got to be like invested and held on a little, you know, you got to pick your time. So you still got to study. I mean, I Can't know be a one -trick pony. I like it. got in a few years ago that, like right now they used to keep and like oh hope, hoping they could 10 times you know but now all of them are changing they're all buying flip stuff now i mean they're probably learning from our podcast you know <laughs> uh, they're literally buying to flip buy everything to flip like let's say i bought, bought a collection for ten thousand they'll flip it for thirteen thousand that's a quick great three thousand dollar profit but if you're setting up on other shows you got to cut those costs add those costs too. And now you're basically that $10,000, your profit's probably like a down to a thousand now. Yep. And you know, is it worth 10,000 to, you know, get a thousand by? So, I mean, if you get 10 of those deal in two weeks, yeah. Yeah. But that's so that's why you have to, you know. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's very interesting. So, I mean, you gotta, you're saying, you know, expand, it, right? Yeah. You gotta get a, a variety of income streams. And, you know, I mean, it seems like sort of like the markets change. So like, you know, okay, it's repack time. And then, you know, then it's, it's, it's buy and hold then it's buy flips. Have you seen um, another question I have for you? Because it's, you mm -hmm. know, tried and true used to work, but have you seen people catching on, you know, to buy, the quarterbacks and then sell the quarterbacks, you know, like buy in July your quarterbacks or buy in June and then sell them in August. You know, if everyone knows that that's kind of like the, the, the thing, you know, is it catching up? Do you expect in August now to be a, a, a whole bunch of supply of quarterbacks come out and maybe the price doesn't, you know, do what it's done the last couple of seasons. Does stuff catch up? Um, no, because there's always late people that likes to wait till the end to buy. <laughs> you know, uh, the, the regular people don't, don't invest that early. I have so many 
people that called me the last three, four deals I bought were people that invested on basketball. Now the basketball is over. Now they want to sell all those things and invest on football. Uh, the sucky part is, you know, it's hard to buy football right now. Yep. I mean, I told them I'll buy it from you. I'll help you, but no, you're, it's not going to be good for you. You actually should probably. I mean, I love it. Basically what, what we get to see, right. Is retail versus actual store versus, you know, a dealer, right? Because, you know, I'm sitting here thinking, oh, I've got my basketball cards. Like, all right, I'd like to get some football. I'd like to get some exposure to the season. And, and mm -hmm. you know, I can see your your customers. Let me sell some of these basketball. Let me sell my Tatum. You know, he didn't he didn't really end the season so well. Let me sell some Tatum now, and, and I'll pick up some Trevor Lawrence, yeah. or I'll pick up some – right? That's exactly the opposite, I think, of what should be happening right now. Right now, you should be selling your Trevor Lawrence and buying those basketball guys because no one's buying yep. them, right? And you get to do that because exactly. you get people coming to you saying, "Hey, I want to, I want to get some exposure." I just read an article that you know uh, Tyreek Hill is going to go for two thousand receiving yards. So I'm going to buy Tua on the cheap, you know. And then, you know, yep. but but, mm -hmm. but what are you selling to buy that Tua? And you know what the funny part is? I will bet you, you have some of the same people who are coming to you now to move their basketball for football. That in a couple of months. The football season will be in yep. the middle, and we're going to start to talk about basketball season starting. And those same people are going to try to sell you some of the quarterbacks that didn't work out for mm -hmm. for Tatum for Tatum money. It, it's a cycle. That's that's the thing, you know. Uh, so sometimes when a quarterback do get hot, let's say you sold, I sold all my Trevor Lawrence. You know, you you, you just got to give up on that person right now, basically, because it's it's you don't want to buy. Yeah. Trevor Lawrence when it's he's priced out like well, he's you and I have had those conversations. Yeah. Mm hmm So this yeah. year you we've had Fields, those conversations, you and I. Fields is like the guy yeah. right now. Kind of scary, you know. He's projected. Why though? To like, he's like five and twenty. He's got to win his, he's got to win the whole he's gotta basically go sixteen and oh to have a winning record for his career. He's he's full of confidence though. He's saying he's gonna have four thousand yard throwing yards, you know. And he's gonna run, so uh, he does have the tools. So let's see. But uh, I don't know. I'm a little scared of uh, Justin Fields still. But. So I'm scared of Fields for a couple reasons. Number one, I don't see that team really doing anything. Number two, his style of play is not something that has real longevity. I'm not talking about career because because the way people invest and buy cars now, they're not talking about career either. They're talking about somebody going six and zero, eight and zero, and making a, you know a killing on that, like they did with Hertz last year and that kind of stuff. They're not looking for a career. But even his style of play, I don't know that he makes it the first eight games without getting nicked up, without getting dinged. You know what I mean? I hope he does. I'm not wishing an injury on anybody. Um, but yeah, I mean the 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 more upright QBs, they have a tendency to stay healthier. I mean, I say that, and Justin Herbert, you know, was obviously yep. you know injured, and you know, so um, what you, quarterbacks are tough. But that's the that's the selling. Football is all about quarterbacks. So if 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 quarterbacks are tough, then you know the fun of I love football is you know. I love the rumors. I love the rumor mill. You know, I mean, and I think if I were um, if I were a football investor, like if, if I were doing this full time, I had time to really do it. It was almost like COVID time where you could like speculate and buy a bunch of like dollar cards mm -hmm. and a whole deal. Like there will be an article about Matt Corral, you know, and there'll be, oh, he's looking great. He might actually get some first team reps or there's going to be an article about Desmond Ritter. Who I mean, his stuff's already been steamed. I would sell that stuff like, you know, oh. Kyle Trask is looking in the best shape of his career. I mean, boom, sell it all. Like this guy, you know, like it, it happens every year. And then you're going to get even the other guys like, you know, um, Jacoby Mac Jones, right? What did you say? You look at Jacoby Brissett, right? He's competing with Sam Howell. Mm -hmm. I, I think Sam Howell is going to get the job. But if he doesn't pan out the first few games, you know, Brissett might be starting again, you know. So it, it's tough. <laughs> I just like, you know, Mac Jones caused me beating up. Wait, you're going to get an article about Mac Jones came into camp after going on a diet and having LeBron's nutritionist. He's in the best shape of his career. He's throwing the ball harder. He's throwing the ball faster. He doesn't have a noodle arm anymore. He's in great shape. And they're all looking forward to a fantastic season this year. And they've put some weapons around him finally. And boom, 
people are going to, th- that article comes out. It's the same article. You could rewrite it every year. You go back and Google it. You'll find it about Zach Wilson going into last season and everybody was buying his cards. It's the mm-hmm. same thing. If that happens, sell. <laughs> yeah. No, that that's hundred percent. It's like every quarterback during camp I sell. I might keep a couple that are just too cheap, you know, it's just, and I think that has good potential. That's what happened with Hertz last year, you know, because to me, Herbert and Boro was just too high. That Hertz is too low, that it's just not worth it for me to sell his national treasure at that time for like 2,500. So we're going to have, we, we do this and we'll go back to national, but we're going to end this with one question. We're both going to throw out a name. We've done it before. We, we throw out our quarterback names that are going to be good. And I think I give Derek Carr as a, you know, as, as a play. Um, give me a quarterback. It doesn't have to be one you're investing in. I want to give away your secrets. But give me a quarterback that you think surprises to the upside this year. I don't know about surprising, but uh, I've been kind of hedging on, on, on a golf and car because they are low. And there are some weapons around them. Um it's just for quick flip. You know, if they have a good season, I will sell them right away too. Mm-hmm. And uh, But I'm not sure those are like long-term investment or anything like that. So if anybody has them cheap, I haven't started buying yet, but I wanted to in this last what? week. You ready? But I haven't started buying. I want to buy. But So again, if anybody has them cheap, you can send them to me and I'll buy them. And maybe I'll look for them at National. But I don't keep secrets from the from the folks who are out there. So people listen to this, they'll, they'll go ahead and jump on them. And Ryan Tannehill. Ryan Tannehill's cards are nothing, and they just signed Hopkins. Yep. He hasn't really had, like, well, it's very rare you have that type of a person to throw to anyway. He's a top receiver mm-hmm. in the league. He doesn't like to practice, but, you know, when we talk about practice, <laughs> um, you know, but Derek Henry, you know, I would probably sell my Henry cards because he's not going to be rushing for 2,000 yards, but maybe the team s- says we're going to – normally it's like let's rest the quarterback – and use the mm-hmm. running back. They're going to try to rest Henry so that they have him at the end of the season. Yep. This way, if they make the playoffs, which I'm thinking that they probably will, that is the team that potentially can beat these other quarterbacks with the running and defense. You That's- slow the game down, you know? And I think Tannehill has a chance to actually do some stuff this year now that they put some weapons around them. And it's not because of him, but no. it doesn't matter, exactly. you know? Mm-hmm. people buying Brock Purdy doesn't mean Brock Purdy's doing all this stuff exactly. they're just winning so he's like Brock Purdy's in the same situation we're not totally relying on him the team is just so good around him but my key to that statement that team the Titans is is Henry to be honest with you yeah Henry's awesome yeah he always start the gate the season like great and then he gets nicked up slowly every week you know and yeah. then when the playoff comes he just not healthy enough my so, hope is that they can, you know, they can stretch him out, keep him healthy, and that's and that's but, the system. Okay. But I'm not sure Ryan Tannehill is 100% have the job yet. So I don't think he does have the job. And and obviously, look, but here's the mm-hmm. thing. I'll believe Levis when I believe Levis, just like I'll believe Malik Willis when I believe Malik Willis. I mean, they signed, you know, both of those guys in the last two years. Willis was not the part. No. Levis dropped into the second round. Yep. I mean, his girlfriend on television during the, during the draft had way more, you know, I think she signed a bigger contract than him. I uh, no, I, you know, I saw that. <laughs> you know, so, uh, you know, it just, that's kind of the way the world is now. But I, I will I will believe it when I see it that he's not the guy. But I'm pretty sure he has like prism rookies too. He's in that like uh he's in that Russell Wilson type where you can get some, you know, some prism stuff of his, chrome mm-hmm. stuff of his. So there's, you know, sometimes that's a bad thing, right? Because yeah. there's no shortage of their of their rookie cards, right? Um, you know, there's more to choose from. It means it's harder for the price to go up, right? Because there's more supply. That means it's good to buy Ryan Tannehill. So <laughs> the the um the national, all right. You've been to several, right? I don't, I don't know if you count how many you've been to. If you know how many you've been to, you've been to several. We'll just, we'll say that. If you know, you can say how many. But you've been to several. Um, I've set up with somebody else, but a total of like fifteen. So fifteen by, nationals by myself, um, like nine, I think. Like I had my own booth, put my name down, you know. So I used to split with a with a dealer, with a vintage guy. So. And then he suddenly retired without telling me. So I had to start from zero. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> didn't even give you this table, which is miserable. But hey, you're, but, you're doing fine. But I do have a, you know, um, I am up for uh, running for the board for the Nationals. So 
So you have that. I was going to take this two ways, but now with running to the board for the national, I'll ask my my one question. But the the end question is going to be split into two parts. I have one question for you in twenty seven mm-hmm. parts, like Doctor mm-hmm. Barbe. It's I want a bit of advice from someone who's been to fifteen of these for dealers and for showgoers who are not setting up. Just you know, some little sage bit of wisdom for you. But before that, okay, you're going to be on the board. You're well, running I'm for the board. Running for uh, is your platform. <laughs> hey, collectors, vote for me, uh, and I will keep the national out of Atlantic City in 2026. Is that is that your platform? Uh, <laughs> so basically, I um I, I listen to obviously the older uh, people that's been doing the show, but also the modern, you know, newer mm-hmm. people. So it's it's good to have like some of those on the board basically um i was speaking to ryan and joe you know those were the people like other people that told me to run for the board uh the people that are voting are basically the people that have boots Mm -hmm. so so they're changing it a little this year so when you're voting for your boots there's also ballot there so if you see sharon and black jaded wolf click on that and you know hopefully we could uh push some of uh, some of our narrative our way so <laughs> oh well you might not answer them because now you're a politician so you might not answer what your thoughts are about the atlantic city we'll so see I'm, well we, I'm, i keep <laughs> what people's thoughts first you know i gotta tell you i was gonna try to say something nice about the atlantic city national and it's hard <laughs> It's hard. Um, the only you know. thing I, 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 okay, I'm not gonna say it's bad. It's it's so close to me. Yes, of course, <laughs> it's I, convenient for the. Yes, because I know they'll never do it in like, you know, Javid Jacobs, you know, Javid yeah, Javits. Because it's it's just too expensive, you know. And the hotels in the area, you got to find a good place. And then Jersey, just just too much shows in Jersey for some reason they don't like Jersey. Um, I don't know, except Atlantic City. Um, I don't know if, if it's going to stay there or not, but the nationals, everything is in Jersey because that, so they're, they're, it's very convenient for them right now. I don't think there's any contract left with, uh, Atlantic city, but, uh, I know they're trying to add a new location. So we'll see. I mean, listen, there's a lot of hotels. You can definitely book a hotel without having to spend two thousand dollars for it, which is what people are paying in Chicago. Some people are paying more than that. I know I'm paying a lot of money. Mm-hmm. Um, no sponsors uh, paying my hotel room enough. I'm paying for myself, my airfare, and mm-hmm. all that other crap. And it's not cheap, but I will say, you know, obviously going to Chicago and then going to Atlantic City, the Chicago setup is great with the hotels right there, with the restaurants right there, the steakhouses right there, the stuff just right there. It's sort of like a self-contained unit. And even though you hear it's Chicago, it's not Chicago. I mean, it's close to Chicago, but it's like this built convention <laughs> little area yeah. um, mm-hmm. where no one is unless you're going to the convention, you know? So it's pretty it's pretty interesting how they've built it. Um, there's no problem walking from your hotel to the convention center when you're there, whereas, you know, Atlantic City was a, it was a little dicey. It's a little yeah. dicey. They have the hotel. They have the um, restaurants, but walking around is just not, you know... It's not, it's, it's not, it's not experience. <laughs> yeah. There's nothing. Yeah. It's not experience. That's the way to go. Okay. So we'll pass on that. You have to be diplomatic. You are currently running for public office, so you can't say anything negative. I get it. I understand. Um, but suffice it to say, she says Atlanta city sucks. No, I'm just kidding. She didn't say that. She didn't say that guys. I promise vote, vote for Sharon. Um, yeah, I said it. So, so there's your question. Now you've been to a bunch of national, obviously the nationals changed over the last 15 years, but beyond like bring a sandwich or a bottle of water, or a phone charger, you know, prep wise, you know, at a table, like, let's say there's a dealer who this is their first time setting up in Chicago. What do you tell that dealer? And then a so, customer who's coming for their first time just to walk the floor and go to the show as a consumer. Okay. Two things I find very important is, um, first, all the shows, I don't usually put a price tag, but this show is the only show I put a price tag because people usually don't find you. There's a lot of impulse buy. They see a card for $40, they buy it right away. Uh, they're not going to check comp because you're so busy. And to be honest with you, they're not going to find you again, you know. And then second thing is I do usually a, a business card just for the nationals to put my booth in there and even scan it where you're located and I usually put a slogan like I oh, last the last two years I put a bear brick in my booth, 
So find the bear break, you know, that type of thing. So you got to find ways that people could find you. Because it's so your, crowded. I like that. That's a good idea. Mm -hmm. Use your social media. Put like a, if it's not a business card, at least a piece of paper, some kind of promo that have your booth on it and people will, you know, will take it with them basically. There you go. I mean, mm -hmm. that's, that's good advice because listen, it turned out not to be the card I was looking for, but I remember in Atlantic City, I was looking for a card and somebody told me the booth that had it, even the booth number, you know, the, the name, the name of not the number, but even, yeah, I finally got the number. I still couldn't find it. <laughs> um, because it was in like one of these weird like corners, but even knowing who I was looking for, I couldn't find them. You know, and you get lost, you get turned around. There's just yep. so many tables, mm -hmm. and so many things. Um, so yeah, no, that's landmarks. landmarks are very important. I'm, I'm like two. If you say tell people, oh, I'm two two rows behind PSA, you know, or you know any landmark, just make sure people find them and usually find the big company attached to yours it's the best way to uh locate you there you go and mm -hmm. then i have one question before you uh comment about you know this the consumers the mm -hmm. you know people who are walking around retail buyers let's call them um mm -hmm. you mentioned um that you have price tags on your stuff right mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. i like that but do you price them down a little bit knowing that people are going to come and buy? And then do you have to like explain to people who are more regulars? Like, no, there's not haggle room. I'm not giving you that for 85% of the price. Uh -huh. That's like a, only this show price because people walk around and pay it. Or do you just mark it up? No, I don't mark it up. I, I price it pretty fair. So it's some rare stuff, you know, it's tough. Let's say it's one card. I'm teaching the people that are working with me to how to price them. One sold for a thousand, one sold for 750 and one sold for 500. There's no way I said, you know, he priced it at 520. <laughs> wow. I'm coming so, to your table. That got edited, you know. I'm going to you look at the the reason why it got, you know, you, you need to read the the price for 500 what some type of a crack on the case or something. So you need to basically right. so I price that it. That card was that, Jalen Hortz, H O R T S on eBay. <laughs> that's possible. <laughs> so you know, it's like a lot of people are posting now before Nasha. It's so funny. Um about oh, comp is not the last thing of and a lot of, of people. You know. Yeah. A lot uh, of people. That's the message. <laughs> yep. So I to me it's always been the thing too. I mean, for rare cards, I mean comp is comp, I understand, but go find another one, you know. Uh, that's the thing it's it's so sometimes and the best buy that i buy or if i really want a card i will pay higher than comp even though there's a comp there you know because uh, you got to follow your guts and some of the best deals are not using comps in my opinion there you go is that the advice to consumers walking around sometimes you just have to pay more if it's a card you really want or what do you got for those folks because you, uh, know you know what i did i have yeah. two for i always tell Ooh, my uh first you really got to research who are you looking for I mean, you, you can't just go walk around. It's like the worst thing to do is just walking around because next thing you know, you have a budget of 5,000 and you spent 3,000 already on cards you don't want really. So research the guys that you really want and don't buy at peak. I mean, I understand you want a Trevor Lawrence, you know, but there are subsets that might be a sleeper on Trevor Lawrence. Let's say Impeccable is a good buy right now. You know, the true RPA, instead of buying... Um, a contender that's super hot, you mm -hmm. know, or a prism auto. There's a lot, if you really want a Trevor Lawrence, if not find a guy that's kind of on the down low, but have upside, like Ryan Tannehill, you said, you know, mm -hmm. uh, you know, that it depends too. If you like younger guys, to me, a Ryan Tannehill is kind of a little older side. Definitely. So it, it's a good flip card if he does well, but it's not a good investment card. So you got to plan. Are you buying for investment? Are you buying for flips? And, you know, it depends on what, how you, you got to have a strategy going into the show. I like it. Mm -hmm. Is that one? Is that two? You have oh, a second and one? then the second one is uh, <laughs> take advantage of on-site grading. If you find, look at the cards, if they're in good condition, you know, instead of shipping them, you save like almost $50 just shipping back and forth. It's grading it there. Uh, Even though some of the grading, like PSA is expensive to grade there. I mean, some of the other grading. No, uh, oh, but see, talk to me. It, is because they're putting it on the higher level though you shouldn't be submitting the cheaper cards you're submitting the, it's actually cheaper because they put the 2500 that's supposed to be 175 or 200 that they're charging 
at that right level, at discounted level. So it's actually a good price, a good deal. PSA is tough, so, long lines, PSA for grading, which is fine. I mean, but I love the point, which is, look, you could, the onsite grading to me is the biggest thing that happens at, at these big shows. I, not I think. the PSA, every, every company. Everyone. Yeah. Get a good deal, you know. Every uh, SGC is there. They're all encapsulating there. If you want to uh, take advantage of on-site encapsulation, if I opened. We we I get a raw out of a box. Zach Wilson downtown Black Pandora, at the National last year. Brought it over to Beckett. It got mm -hmm. you know, three nine fives and a ten. You know, nine total nine five. You know, uh, all nine fives like a you know quad mm -hmm. plus. You know, you know, excuse me, uh, you know, Gem Plus, whatever the heck you want to call it. They're, I, I don't know what they're calling them now. Beckett Select, the Beckett guy, all kinds of fun. Um, but it was a good grade, and they did it right there, you know, slabbed it. And I walked mm -hmm. around with the show, and I I got, I traded it in $3,000 worth of value for that, which is ridiculous thinking about exactly. it now because it's Zach Wilson. So that's but, the best thing to do if you got a, who, who, if you don't like Zach Wilson, you know, you should trade that card. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, those, I, got, those I, I, I traded it. I added cash to that. I got a Will Chamberlain rookie. Yeah. So see, <laughs> <laughs> so that's, that's like the best a... way to take advantage of nationals. You know, uh, everything is there. All the grading company um, to move some stuff and probably pick up some stuff, especially basketball. They're so low right now. If you have some football, Trevor Lawrence, that should be like half the price, but it's, you know, so high trade them. Um, a Luca or a Tatum that's like half its price three months ago, you know. So only have two Trevor Lawrence cards, neither of them I think people want. And Ian pulled them both in packs, so I can't really bring them. One's a <laughs> it's a rare car. So he got the con from, from contenders when he was still wearing the college uniform. Oh, okay. The ticket one that's like die cut and like jersey yeah. numbers. So like no, they're only limited to 16 autographs, a sticker auto, but it's a nice one. And he okay. got a playbook auto, you know, like the booklet playbook auto. I think it was out of 149 or something like that. But so we got those. You should sell those. I know. Something else. <laughs> I know. He won. But I mean, I like I like saving stuff that he pulls. You know what I mean? That way it's, you know, I'm just say, oh, you got that out of a car. And then we got that out of a pack. We got that. And remember that. So it's cool stuff. But no, he trust me. I tell him he should sell them. I said, if you like oh, Trevor yeah. Lawrence, you want to hold it. We should sell these and I'll get you something else. I'll, I'll put some money towards the contenders or something. I think we, you, you can know. convince him to get something he wants. Yeah. You know, what does he want? What's for, uh, for all last year? He wanted only Pokemon. Now he's like, sell some Pokemon. <laughs> My, that, it's actually not a good time to sell Pokemon. Yeah, I know. It's nuts. But you know what he does have? He, he was pretty smart. He's been stockpiling the Thompson twins. He has oh, a ton of their cards, a ton from like OTE and the Inception mm -hmm. stuff, the Chrome, because, you know, we had Overtime Sam on the show and, you know, he came on and we were opening those. I mean, those Inception boxes were like 40 bucks a box at my I LCS. I actually have a bunch of the Thompson Twins too, so. See? Mm -hmm. So I hope they start off hot because we we, we, could, we could be doing all right. <laughs> he, I, I think the first summer league game, uh, he played well, and then he kind of got nicked up a little. And they, it's not seriously injured, but they kind of stopped him from playing. Kind of like a uh, Victor, they pulled him after two games. You know. Yeah, Miller too. I think Miller yep. scored twenty six for the Hornets. They said, "That's it. We've That's seen it. enough. <laughs> you're, 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 you're good. We're fine." And uh, you know, but I mean, listen, that gives a chance for other people. Like, I mean, I'm watching summer league. Like Cam Whitmore, the kid from Villanova, right? He was like the summer league MVP. Yep. That kid dropped. He was the one that was like best available, you know, like Mel Kuyper's <laughs> draft board, best available. He was just continued best available. Yep. Of course, mm -hmm. we opened Bowman's best. That was the auto we got. Cam Whitmore. Oh, so I'm going to root for him, too. Yeah. <laughs> now <laughs> you can tell him. <laughs> yeah, I should. It's out of 25. It's a nice one. It's like a speckly numbered Dude, Cam Whitmore don't auto. Don't hold anything that's not in pro uni. You can tell <laughs> it while he's hot. <laughs> yeah, that's all we call. I have my Trevor Lawrence in his in his Clemson uniform. I got Cam Whitmore. You're the one who's telling everyone to sell it. Now you're not sell. You're not taking if, your own advice. If Ian pulls it out of a pack with me, it's tough to sell. It's you yeah. know, I mean, it's the it's the father son nostalgia that's of the cards. You know, it's the collectors <laughs> in us. I guess I convinced him to sell a, a one Benyama last week. The Bowman's oh. best. He sold a he sold a base card. I said, this is going to be half what it's spread now. Let's just sell it. I'll buy it back for you. If you really like that card, I'll buy it back in six months for less than half of what it sells for now. So he bought it. <laughs> he bought it. He said, okay, you could sell it. I said, all right, good enough. So I love it. Everybody who's listening, please go ahead and look for Black Jaded Wolf. Give her the code uncaged at the National for a special deal on a card. 
you would have got the same deal anyway if you don't use the code. But I just want to make you feel special like you're listening. You got a code. She gives good deals to everybody. <laughs> we love you guys. Thanks for listening. Thank you. Bye. Bye.